Hello, thanks for joining me and welcome back to Western Australia. Um, today I just want to look at one building, the most stunning and gorgeous Albany Bell Castle. It's a bit of a surprise when you see it. She's definitely below ground level um, and I will briefly discuss the builder and his exploits etc um, and a few other tidbits in relation to the building. So hopefully this is part of a series and we'll call this number one Castles in Suburbia. Here we go. Wake up and listen. Okay, so let's see what uh, Wikipedia has to say about it. The Albany Bell Castle is a heritage listing, listed building on the corner of Guildford Road and Thirlmere Road in the Perth suburb of Mount Lawley. It was built in 1914. Now I've got different dates and different stages, but between 1914 and 1919 um, for the Albany Bell Limited Company to manufacture cakes and confectionery for its tea rooms uh, two miles three kilometers from Perth with natural springs that could supply a hundred thousand gallons of fresh water per day um, the company's founder Peter Albany Bell note that there's no Wikipedia page about him used ideas derived from the Cadbury factory in Bourneville United Kingdom to incorporate superior working conditions and amenities for employees construction by Alexander Cameron there's no information I can find about him the only Alexander Cameron I can find is in Victoria and nothing to do with architecture um, styled on the let me say that right Girardelli chocolate factory in San Francisco uh, built in two stages the North Wing 1914 single-story bakehouse uh, I think that might be the bit with the curved roof I'll point out later um, da, 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 fireboxes Rooms cooled by compressed gas. Second stage completed in 1919, including a basement with double brick cavity walls, which provided the ideal conditions for the dipping of chocolates. And this is how those soft centers go in. Glug, glug, glug. Doesn't it make your mouth water? Whether it's hearts or other shapes, in this room we're at the kernel of the matter, for this is the chocolate maker's holy of holies. It's here that sweetness simmers contentedly, far from the impatient world outside, and where he'll show you the secrets of curvature or chocolate dipping. Would you guess, for instance, that those tempting ridges on the top of the chocolates are made as simply as this? Just watch how he handles the form. I should also note, there's dispute over that figure. Excellent leave conditions for the time. You've got two whole weeks pay, uh, paid leave. Da, 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 this bit. The factory changed hands many times, becoming a chicken hatchery and later a reserve building for WA newspapers during World War II when there were concerns that the paper's building might be bombed. Uh, became officers for the Department of Transport and the Civil Aviation Authority, so then back to government. Later, Royal WA Institute for the Blind, uh, establishing a blind school. And the building became vacant again in the 70s. It was used for rehearsals by the West Australian Opera. And in 1992 was assessed under Heritage Council criteria and adopted in 1991. So from the Heritage Council of Western Australia, um, I won't go through all of this. It's here if you want to read it. It's more about the man himself. I think I've covered most of it in various parts of this video. I just will note too that the reference for a lot of it is Batty's Cyclopedia of Western Australia. So there again, uh, Dr. 
James Sykes Batty, our Grand Master Freemason and Curator of Western Australian History. So what I actually wanted to look at is the physical evidence. So this is taken from a conservation plan um, by the Civil Aviation Authority. So North Wing is single storey red brick with elaborate stucco decoration to the north and west walls. The external leaf is 110 millimeter brickwork in stretcher bond. The internal leaf is 230 millimeter English bond bagged and painted. Uh, castellated parapets along the north and west walls supported on timber purlins and timber trusses. South wing is two storey red brick building with a single storey addition to the east. Uh, both with elaborate stucco decoration to the south and west external walls. Uh, external leaf is also 110 millimeter brickwork in stretcher bond. The internal leaf 230 millimeter again. A major addition has been added along the entire length of the north face of the single storied section, toilets and a single stair project outs project outside the northern wall of the two-storied section. The west wing is a red brick building with elaborate stucco decoration to the south, west and north external walls comprising a main floor with two corner towers and a basement. Wide brick archways link the west wing to the south and north wings. The northern opening has been bricked up Ground floor and basement internal walls under the towers are supported on steel beams and columns. It is not known if this is the original or whether the internal walls have been removed at some stage. Uh, and the rest of it's there if you want to look at it. I won't go through it all. Okay, so let's take a look at Mr. Peter Albany Bell. So he was a caterer and philanthropist. Uh, born in 1871 in South Australia. Important to note he had little formal education before moving with his widowed mother to Western Australia in 1887. He was a draper's delivery boy, an inland stockman and a shop assistant. Then in 1894 he opened a small shop in Hay Street, Perth, making and selling confectionery and lemon squash. In the next decade, he opened more shops and a confectionery factory, and in 1898, he studied the soda fountain trade in the United States of America. So for about 30 years, his tea rooms were famous. Um, I do have corroboration of that from Elizabeth Durack, and I will brief, briefly talk about Elizabeth Durack because she has some interesting light to shed on our history. Um, I'll just pop that in. I thought it was important to note here, Bell was an early convert to the Churches of Christ and his creed and a social conscience turned him to philanthropy. An enthusiastic member of the Young Men's Christian Association, he volunteered to work for it overseas in 1916 um, sailed in October in the Afric and served in both England and France. He returned home in February 1919 and was discharged in March. He had been commissioned as a Justice of the Peace in 1909 and had served on the Children's Court. On a business trip to the United States in 1915, he had studied progressive treatment of juvenile delinquents after retiring from business in 1928, he bought acreage at Rowlands near Bunbury, uh, which became the Chandler Home for Unemployed Boys and later the Rowlands Aboriginal Mission. I just wanted to note the uh, references for this too. We've got the Batty Library again. Um, and I would dearly love to go and listen to, there are audio tapes um, of Mr. Bell himself in the State Library, which is the Batty Library. Um, but I haven't had a chance to get in there and listen to all of those. Um, we will talk about um, Elizabeth Durack's recordings, though, because they're available online. He built this house. He had nine children who well, one had died, so he had eight children when he built the house. And he built this magnificent house uh, in 1912. 
Well, he called it pineapple. He called it pineapple. It wasn't pineapple in, but he, he called it pineapple. Yeah, that's the old Gables. Yeah, it's where the Gables is now. Yeah. Yep. It's exactly where the Gables is now. They, they knocked the house down, the, the Gables, which is a shame, because it's a magnificent house. He had two tennis courts uh, alongside the house. And two years later, 1914, he'd been to America and seen uh, Deodelli and, and uh, Cadbury in, in Thornhill, and he built this for Carson. Okay, so I won't um, show you any more of the video. Uh, it's probably a bit risky to do that. But I will say that Terry talks a lot about um, several aspects of the man and all in a very favourable light. Um, he talks about his work with the YMCA and with the Church of Christ to the point of fanaticism. Um, for highlights, if anyone wants to go back and watch this, at 26 minutes he talks about how he swapped the neighbouring house for the Rowlands building, uh, which is where he set up the Chandler Boys' home. And at the 32-minute mark, he explains that the building is actually double-cavity uh, brick being three courses thick. At 53 minutes, he talks about that the main mission of the man and his um, son one of the sons, was to spread the word of the Lord and he gave, they gave the bulk of their money away and pretty much died with nothing. And at the 57 mark, 57 minute mark, he discusses the pineapple estate, which is a much argued about estate. Um, basically, the land that the Bell Castle is on is meant to be part of the estate but uh, the Pineapple Inn, as it was, was bowled over, so they say, to make way for the Bell Castle. I might disagree and say that it is the same building, but um, I don't have any other proof other than the situation it's in. He did also mention that in 1827, when Captain Sterling explored the river, he recorded pineapples growing there, which was reported back by dispatch. Um, I haven't got a reference for that other than Terry here, so I'll leave you to think about that. Okay, so this is an original image from 1928, or supposedly so. Uh, you'll note the flags, which to me don't look like they were always there. There is something I noticed from the video that the photo they have looks like there's something shadowy here and here I'm seeing some sort of cut on this image so I don't know if they've done something there. I will note that shadow looks in line, perhaps that's all okay. Um, these ladies' shadows look okay given the shadows from the trees, etc. I'm not sure about these three. I don't think that looks right at all. But And this is the, the neighbouring house that is mentioned in the video and I showed in the little video snippet. Um, but that's her in the 1920s. So you can see there's retaining wall all the way around here even back then and... That's the basement, apparently. So there you go. And this from the State Heritage website. Um, now converted into apartments, the Albany Bell Castle began life in 1914 as a factory producing confectionery and cakes. Something unexpected, perhaps, given the detailing of the facades. You reckon? So here she is today, as it looks. And you can see the fences and the staircases leading down to what's supposedly the basement level. And I should be able to take you around the side. So yes, there's a cat at the window if anyone's hearing anything weird. It's not me. Uh, don't really see a lot there. It is all gated off. Uh, 
looking to get a look down here. You can see that this has all been added on. But this looks original. So here, um, Maylands is a very important area and I will hopefully talk more about Maylands in the future because of the uh, three brickworks I think I've so far found there. So it would appear that's where most of our brickworks came from. And yeah, the pineapple estate was here. So Captain Sterling came down the river uh, and this is Perth City. So we're very close to the city here. Okay, so I can't take us in there. The um, place is divided up into apartments now and it's all gated off. Um, but I can take you through some of the real estate pages because they're all publicly available. Let's have a look. So this is looking over the fence. You can see um, even though they've got a a half a floor here it's still cut off and it goes further down inside This is in one of the towers. The stairs going up to the top. Top. Not a bad spot. This is the city over here. Must be the other turret. This is a really good image. I wanted to show you this one. When I first looked at this, I've looked at the windows and the curtains and then looked over here and thought, oh, what's that little cupboard about? And then I realized that that is the door into the room. So that's a normal size door, normal size wardrobe. And these are the windows um, and the height of the ceiling. So if that was, what would that door height be? Seven feet, it'd be 14 feet ceilings. Pretty high. A normal person could barely look out that window. Again, same in here. Very high. Normal door height, ceiling height.
this light comes halfway down the window probably still difficult to reach look to the top of the door roughly this is a good one showing you the stairs up to the first floor level and the ground level below Another real estate page, minute 14. This one, look at all that curved brick. So I'm not sure what exact part that is, but we've also got windows on the floor. And see the height of those windows, they're pretty big. And here, so that's above the TV, and it goes way up. Get a better angle. That must be from the back. Oh, look at that sky. There we go. That's a very tall, very narrow room. So there's your normal door height and there's your window. Massive. Look at this. Forget painting, I like it like that. And just on the Chandler Boys Home, which became the Rowlands Native Mission Farm, uh, it operated from 1938 to 1975. Uh, I did want to note, was opened by Mr Albany Bell in 1938, uh, Chandler Boys Farm. He was a sponsor of child welfare activities. Um, it was meant to be a self-sustaining farm for Aboriginal families. In 1941, Rowlands changed its focus to become a home for part Aboriginal children, classified as quadroons, under eight years old. The first children came from the Moore River Native Settlement in October 1941. By 1944, there were 26 children at Rowlands and a part Aboriginal ki kindergarten teacher was appointed in 1945. Uh, I also wanted to point out it had been reported that the wages at Rowlands were poor and that people did not stay for long at Rowlands. 
So I don't know if this was a good place or a bad place. Um, there's a lot of talk about the stolen generation in Australia. This is ov obviously some part of it, but I won't go into it further here. I'm also including uh, links here today for video and audio of Elizabeth Durack. Now, Elizabeth Durack was a fairly famous Australian artist. Um, her sister Mary, an author, their father, a politician. I just wanted to include her, as she notes in the recordings, working working for um, Peter Albany Bell. She also mentions at the 37 minute mark in session three, uh, extremely important. I think everybody that's interested in Australian history needs to hear this. Um, she says specifically, history has been turned on its head. She also mentions the manipulation of the indigenous Australians and the sudden re-rendering of our country. She doesn't go too far into what she means by that, but basically she spells it out. They have rewritten history. So please go and listen to this uh, while it's still available for us, folks. And here an article in the West Australian. I won't go through it all because it's not completely relevant. Um, I did want to just point out that the this image, which I haven't seen elsewhere, is uh, one of his stores. So this is one of the Hay Street stores in the 1890s. So I'm presuming that may be one of his first stores. Hmm, interesting. So he built the, fin the finished the building in 1919 and 1928. He called it a day with the business. And that's all I have for you today in under half an hour. Hooray. Um, just another quick look at the timeline there if you want to pause and check that. Otherwise, thank you so much for listening and watching. Um, like, share, subscribe. Please leave a comment. Catch you next time.